So welcome, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're delighted to be in this wonderful exhibition, Two New Bodies of Work by the artist Matthew Day Jackson. Uh, the show is called The Still Life and the Reclining Nude. And as you can see, Matt has drawn on these traditions of art history, which he then in his own unique way um, changes, layers through the use of um, pro its own processes and materials to create new meanings. Um, the, the first time that Matt showed in London was actually in 2006, and the curator who presented a show of his at Qubit is Tom Morton, who will be in conversation with Matt today. Uh, Tom is a writer as well as being a curator, and he's a contributing editor for Freeze. Thank you very much, Chloe. Matt, hello. Hi. Hey. So I want to start off by talking about your incredibly um, futuristic title, Still Life and Reclining Nude. Uh, I guess partly why the singular there, why still life and reclining nude rather than lives and nudes, um, and why these two tropes, I guess, in Western art history as basis for this show. Um, I think that I, the quickest I can say it is that I think that in our current uh, political moment, uh, current, this current moment, I can only talk about it really from being in the United States, um, there's been a constant revealing um, of um, the, the inner workings of the body, which is the culture, the society that I'm a part of. And I think that, um, you know, whether it be like through the Me Too movement or Black Lives Matter or, you know, constantly being confronted with gun violence in the United States, I think that it reveals that there is a foundation um, that there are traditions um, that support like this current moment. And so going back to being an artist, um, like what are my powers as being an artist? And I think that maybe some of us have struggled with our, like what can we do to affect positive change? How can I use the tools that I have to, um, to make a contribution towards moving forward. And so in this case, I, I wanted to um, address two uh, traditions um, in art um, that I think talk about um, our natural environment, our relationship to that, um, ideas of bodies and um, how those bodies are defined. Um, and we, we'll get more into that, I guess, as we go on. But that, in a nutshell, is why I chose to do these two things. But I'm also, it's like it's always been throughout the whole um, body of my, through, throughout my career, um, I've always been interested in um, images, narrative um, forms from the past and how they show themselves in the present. And so this is you know, a continuation of, of that. Absolutely. Um, so I think perhaps let's start with the paintings, because over lunch we talked a lot about the sculpture yeah. and a little less about the painting. Yeah. Um, and I guess paintings is a kind of interesting term for a start, because there's not that much paint. Yeah. Um, on the surface of these, if any, indeed. You know, yeah. there's, um, so, but you very much kind of put them in the tradition of painting, you know? Yeah. Um, and they, indeed, they draw on um, the work of Jan Bruegel and Son. You know? Yeah. And can you tell me a little bit about what attracted you to specifically that um, still life tradition um, developed by Jan Bruegel and Son? What are the kind of contours of their project? You know, why you know, that particular moment in history as well? Does that become very interesting to you? Uh, I mean, I think that, um, so it started really stupid. I thought, like, I wanted to make some happy art, so I thought, um, like, what's happy? Like, puppies are happy, and kittens in a basket are happy. Uh, sunsets are happy. Um, I don't know, paintings of trees are happy. I like trees. And I thought, oh, like maybe flowers. Maybe I should look at mm. flowers. And so I started looking at flower painting and, of course, landed looking at Jan Bruegel and uh, his son um, sort of creating this as, as a mm. genre. And what got me interested in it was thinking about them in relationship to their historical moment, um, what Bruegel's paintings, what the Bruegel's paintings, the Bruegel family's paintings, um, you know, celebrated were... Um, this uh, access, right, to mm -hmm. the world um, in 16th, 17th century, um, which of course uh, uh, brought um, to that part of Europe a tremendous bounty of material bounty, material wealth, but at the same time 
also brought to the United States, um, you know, was integral in America's slave trade and 300 years of um, slave labor upon which um, our economy is built upon. Mm -hmm. And um, which of course is bankrupt. The second part was that it's also a celebration of Eden as a gift to us to create this um, constructed environment. Mm -hmm. I don't have that faith system. Those aren't any, a part of my belief, beliefs, but that those paintings were a celebration of that. But then also it's like that these paintings were also a celebration of one's individual um, ability to capture all of these things and mm -hmm. place them on display as an example, as a show of their wealth. And at the same time, um, like understanding that the, these component parts of those paintings, um, how they function like biologically. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, as far as I understand um, with the Bruegel's paintings, um, the flowers that um, we see in the originals wouldn't have bloomed necessarily in the same soil or at the same time. So there's this kind of sense of a human mastery over space and time, which yeah. is you know, of a piece with the colonial project. Huh? Yeah. And were you interested as well in the, kind of the violence of, uh, I mean, it's a very simple violence, one that we kind of overlook, and you know, the violence of the cut flower. Yeah. Something that was living is, yeah. you know, these are, you know, um, if you want to kind of you know, stress this, you know, they're corpses on display. In yeah. Sense, huh? Was this something that was interesting to you in your development of these works? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there have been a lot in, the, in my work, there's been a lot of um, conversation about the memento mori, um, mm -hmm. really talking about, um, talking about, um, you know, a reminder of death, and, and I've never really thought of it that way, but rather like a reminder like to live now. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as these things are concerned, there's definitely a bit of that, um, especially if you think about the show in relationship to the figures, that they, that they take on a sort of funerary mm -hmm. aspect. Um, and so, I, yeah. And um, I mean, we look, if we look kind of closely at these works, we see, well, there are, some flowers, some of the flowers are actually something else. Can you talk us through some of the things? I mean, there's um, explosions. Um, there's the kind of B of the bang of um, an atomic test. Yeah. Um, there's you know, lots of things that aren't flowers in these, that aren't yeah. blooms. Yeah? yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, like the, this, you know, celebration of excess, it's like, a, it's, it's like for the comedy, like we'll yeah. talk about these horrible events and then we have the comedy of the construction that's yeah. happening somewhere. Uh, well, the way that I've thought about these flowers, right, is that they're a collection of, uh, if we could think about them as a metaphor for elements and thinking about the elements that come together to create this built, constructed mm. reality, all of the paintings are, all of the, the materials of the painting are entirely artificial created out of composite materials, that sort of redoubling that idea mm -hmm. of like bringing these things together to the mixing and mashing yeah. of them to create this other thing. But at the same time, you know, like as we re, um, as we reconstitute um, our natural environment in the form of like, I don't know, uh, these mints or our iPhone or um, a weapon or something that there's a, I'm always interested in, in how our use of technology affects how we relate to one another. And um, there's been a really long line of work that talks about our uh, nuclear heritage. And so all of the images that really aren't flowers harken back to that moment. If we could think about these paintings, not necessarily as being um, something that's being brought together, but rather um, like coming apart and because the, mm -hmm. the original paintings, when I first looked at them, that mm -hmm. their, their exuberance was yeah, yeah. explosive, right? Mm -hmm. And so they could be thought of as like the fracturing of that, of those elements as well. And so the images do relate to the Trinity test site. I mean, that painting there is kind of like Could a, you explain for anyone um, who doesn't know what the Trinity yeah. test site is, what it is briefly? Yeah, um, through, I can say, I'll try and do it quickly. Yeah, yeah. Throughout my career, throughout my life as an artist, like the best thing about being an artist is that it's a way to sort of um, recapture aspects of my education, which was not very good when I was growing up. And so I get kind of stuck in research about particular things. And first I was um, in, like sort of obsessed with Eleanor Roosevelt um, and made a lot of work about her. And then I was obsessed with Jim Jones and the People's Temple because I saw it as a way to talk about America as a sort of religious cult. 
And then, uh, then came along uh, Buckminster Fuller, then uh, Robert Oppenheimer. And Robert Oppenheimer, um, you know, the gadget and the Trinity test site is where um, the first nuclear test happened. Um, you know, and I've also talked about how Hiroshima and Nagasaki were essentially nuclear tests as well. Mm -hmm. Quite. Yeah. Um, and so um, ushering in like a new moment in human history, but also to a certain degree in having that, um, you know, the reason why I keep going back to that is because um, so much of the development of that technology is emblematic of a sort of bankruptcy of really f seeing no boundary between a battlefield and a city and mm -hmm. like a goldfish and um, I don't know, a sniper on top mm -hmm. of the building. Yeah, you know, yeah. There's no differentiation in that. And so, um, but the Trinity test site was in Los Alamos in New Mexico in July of 1945. Mm. That's when they detonated the gadget. And that wiry orb thing is uh, um, fundamentally the same thing as Fat Man, mm -hmm. which was dropped in Nagasaki, yeah, yeah. which is a second weapon. So we already knew that that would go off. And yeah. so Little Boy was a totally new device. They didn't actually mm -hmm. know what they thought yeah, yeah. it would work. But anyway, so blah, blah, blah. But yeah. And so do you think you ended up making happy? Paintings, huh? You think you ended up making happy paintings from you know, that? Uh... The thing is, I, I I just am attracted to what I'm attracted to, and it just is that way. Um, but I think that you know the way that things are made always, mm -hmm. um, whether it be a walking stick or um, a painting uh, or the sculpture, that that I'm hopefully in making the thing that there's something that's engaging in mm -hmm. how those things are made and how strange and complicated they are, but hopefully done to a point where um, they're like well-made. Mm -hmm. I think it comes from like primarily from a working class family and seeing my value as an individual being reflected in my labor. Mm -hmm. um, so that was like, a, um, so I see that as actually strangely joy joyful, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah. I mean, I guess it's also a way to, to imbue the works with a kind of degree of intensity that exceeds like the photographic or exceeds the kind of the manufactured good or, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think to a certain degree, it's like a trap. Mm -hmm. yeah, like it, it's okay. like, I like, I like the idea that you could enter into the work from a lot of mm -hmm. different ways, but then kind of once you're, you've entered it, that there, that I'm not like it's it's absolutely for Micah, mm -hmm. and the image that's on top is absolutely this thing, and so there's not, the, there's a lot of different interpretations, mm -hmm. but um, it's a, like it's about the precision of placing those things there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe we can draw it out more if there are questions later. But I mean, uh, can we move on to the idea of scale in this show? <coughs> I mean, we have this, you know, this vast kind of explosion in lots of ways of flowers, you know, vastly bigger. And um, the thistles here are kind of just slightly bigger, mm -hmm. these Scottish thistles which you've cast yeah. um, on the odalisk pieces here. Yeah. Um, can you can talk about that a little bit in terms of kind of like the human scale here, yeah? Yeah. And I guess the kind of botanical scale yeah. and how that operates in this system and also the sort of true scale almost given by the tools that we have in the corners. Yeah. Um, of the room? Um, I think about uh, the scale of the painting is all, of our, this is really boring, but you know, really, um, in this case, um, aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And I'm always interested in how, you know, like, can I make something that's you know, this big, that has that same um, sort of force or whatever, mm -hmm. that has that same power? And um, you know, in some cases, when you get up close enough where it takes up your um, your peripheral vision, yeah. um, I find that it's like a like an enveloping that is exciting to play with in painting or making an image. Um, but as far as the scale of the other works, that they were really chosen based on like mm, no, the way that we've uh, made the vector line file to mm -hmm. to cut this particular piece of formica yeah, that yeah. it really looks best at this scale. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's dumb. I mean, it's like a, I like chocolate. Okay. And <laughs> I like the size of that thing, you know, but how the material, the, yeah. That's the only sort of arbitrary. Mm -hmm. In terms of the real, I, when I'm making um, sculpture of the figure or the or figurative 
yeah, figurative sculpture, um, it's always in relationship to my own scale. Mm -hmm. You know, to a certain degree, I feel like I'm kind of always making me. In a yeah, way. yeah. And in fact, I mean, yep. you have used, you know, sort of um, three models of your skull and yep. works, you know, for many, many years. Yep. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, moving on um, to the odalisks um, for a moment, um, I understand that the pieces of sort of, um, of wood, you know, branches and so on, were collected by you on walks in both your homes in Wyoming and in Brooklyn as well, yeah? No, they're only no. Made, they were only made in Wyoming. Oh, okay, um, only We're actually making okay. one now, because I just, um, at the studio, mm -hmm. I just found this really great, there was this dumpster full of just like crap, mm -hmm. and so I emptied the dumpster into the studio, and that's the, what new figures are being made out of now. Yeah. So, um, there's not really a place necessarily that they should mm -hmm. be made, but mm -hmm. um, in Wyoming, where there's a lot of like cut off, rotten bits of, pieces is like a bounty of material mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah. So were these kind of solo walks were these kind of you know no in a lot of cases with a, you know, friends who work in the studio with you or well the um, Andy and I yeah, yeah. would uh, go into the woods and look for chunks and yeah. be like okay like willfully engaging in this sort of anthropomorphic way like, mm -hmm. okay I want to make one that's like sitting more upright like that thing and it mm -hmm. I want to find like a masculine torso, yeah, human torso out of a chunk of wood. And it started in two places, which are both really funny. So I have two little boys and mm -hmm. we go on walks and one finds a face in everything and then the other one finds a gun in everything, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's just like, we just at the end of the walk, we'll have like a collection of weird sticky junk and then there's like a pile of rocks and, um, and just kind of recognizing like that, that really is fundamentally the way that we mm -hmm. do, that is our relationship to nature, is like constantly seeking reflection of ourselves. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not, that it, it's, um, it's our inability to see it, you know, and it's like the reason why, you know, there are people that believe that climate science isn't real and that it's snowing outside, so it must mean that everything's cool, mm -hmm. but no, it's not. And so the other side too is that I was making a sculpture like over there, and then over here in the weeds, uh, there was a tall grass, there was this um, chunk of wood. It's actually the foundation for the sculpture in the middle. Uh -huh. um, and I recognized that uh, it looked like a human body yeah. sticking out of the weeds, which of course put me down this like kind of perverse dark path where it started to adhere to all the other images of bodies in mm -hmm. my mind. And mm -hmm. I was thinking about human bodies. Yeah. And then, because I know a little bit about the um, Black Dahlia, the, mm -hmm. when they found her, this was a murder in the 50s yep. in Los Angeles, that when they found her, um, that she didn't look real. She looked like a mannequin, because mm -hmm. she had been bled. And the way yeah. that she was um, cut, um, people couldn't believe that she was real. But it's also like one of those things that you, I, I think that people couldn't believe, couldn't see it, because mm -hmm. it was yeah, unimaginable, yeah. you know? Anyway. And so that led to, oh, I'm gonna go into the woods and look for more body parts. And playful, not in a gross, creepy yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. But no, I mean, it's the place where you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's wandering through the woods. But, yeah. And um, so these were brought back and they were, um, we talked over lunch about um, the sort of the very kind of reduced um, set of tools you use to produce um, the Odalisk sculptures. Yeah. Um, so they're all made from kind of found, well, the, the casts are from found wood. I mean, I guess the thistles, um, clearly they're, they, they aren't, you know, they're not dead thistles, so, or you know, they're pulled up from the ground, yeah, maybe, yeah, I guess, definitely. yeah? But all the, all the wood is kind of, you know, it's cast off from trees, it's kind of broken off in storms, etc. yeah? Yeah. Um, and so you've, I've noticed you've kind of pre preserved some of the breakages. Yeah. And then there are these kind of rather abrupt moments, which yeah. you made, I think, with a chainsaw. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there, um, all the sculptures are made um, with a screw gun, um, a chainsaw, and a shotgun. And the work with um, making, the, making the pieces with the shotgun started um, during the presidential election and August 1st of 2016, um, the Texas State Department of Education um, allowed students to carry um, firearms uh, if you're 21 and over on college campus. 
And that was also, they rolled that out on the 50th anniversary mm -hmm. of the first popular school shooting, which was a clock tower shooting. Mm -hmm. And we've all like, you know, become um, accustomed to, um, to a sort of cynicism that is so bankrupt. But that was really the first time mm -hmm. that I recognized like how cynical, <laughs> how cynical it was. And I think that for all of us, I mean, for other artists in the room, like what, how do we deal with this moment? Like, I, and I feel like this sort of like level of impotency where like, how can I affect this positive change? What do I do with like mm -hmm. um, anger? Like, what do mm -hmm. I do with like all of that? And I felt like the only way that I could really make commentary on that was to do it with a shotgun, mm -hmm. to do it with the tool that I'm being critical of. I had to implicate myself in the use of this tool mm -hmm. to make meaningful criticism of it because so much of that tool, so much of that idea of even the ownership mm -hmm. of that tool is fundamental to really understanding like my Americanness mm -hmm. in a weird way. So I think that there are three kind of fundamental things that one needs to understand to really have an understanding of American culture and one uh, is the Civil War, two is private property ownership, mm -hmm. and three is the firearm and how, mm -hmm. that, how that functions. You know, it's like in, in, mm -hmm. in Norway or in Sweden, there are a lot of people that have guns, sure. and it's basically just considered a dangerous um, sporting, dangerous sporting equipment. Mm -hmm. But, um, so I think, I thought about, like each one of these is probably about 80, 80 rounds. Um, so can you talk, um, I mean, I sorry. know how they're made, but can you talk these guys through the process of using oh. a shotgun to, carve with, I guess, essentially? Um, well, you load the shotgun over and over and over again, and you shoot at it, shoot at a piece of plywood, um, you know, trying to cut out the center. Um, but I, I, and when you do it over and over and over again, the um, viol it, it hurts. Mm -hmm. And so I really became aware that, you know, in using this tool to be critical of this tool, that what I was participating in is like a sort of, like, um, meditation mm -hmm. through flagellation, yeah, yeah. you know, and that, that I, I think that, you know, I think that there, I don't know, for other people that are in the room dealing with this particular moment in time of that sort of listlessness and mm -hmm. the, and at least the way that I'm feeling in relationship to waking up every morning at 530 and the first word that I'm oftentimes reading is Trump, Trump yeah. the, like the destabilizing anger in that, like how mm. do we deal with mm. it? Um, and it just really came out in this like uh, stupid way of engaging with the material in that way. So shot until the plywood, the center of the plywood comes out, which created a frame. Mm -hmm. And I was making them as sculptures that were like an oculus. Yeah, yeah. So a frame, like what does it mean, this four by eight sheet of plywood to then um, create a space um, to meditate and created in this particular mm -hmm. violent fashion. Anyway, maybe it's dumb, but that was what I was thinking about. And can you speak to kind of, um, I mean, you have, um, plywood's an important material for you, yeah. you know, in terms of its, um, its cultural uses, its backstory. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit to that, please? Yeah, I um, mean, that's also a relationship to the painting, is that the plywood um, is a common material. So on the in the house that I grew mm -hmm. up in, uh, there are two layers of CDX, right? And then above that is carpet padding, mm. and then above that's the carpet, and underneath there are two by tens at 16 inch center across, mm -hmm. you know, the span of the floor. And, you know, that it's really um, the space that we're in now, this is all drywall, four feet mm -hmm. by eight feet um, pieces. And I think of that as like this sort of like a membrane mm -hmm. in, in relationship to domestic space, that that's like the, like a semi-permeable semi-permeable membrane where culture and values, right? The mm -hmm. values of this culture are taught from inside the home. So it's just like, yeah. through a, like a sort of osmosis through that space, but it is within that space constructed, constructed of material like mm -hmm. that. That's like, that's where, um, that's where I became, you know, who I am. Yeah, yeah. My mom, like every meal that my mom made or every, as a child, everything. So yeah, yeah. the materials, like I, I've seen plywood as a scale of one and, and as figurative at the same time. 
Robert Gober, um, yeah. I think, has really eloquently um, made sculptures that sort of reify that mm -hmm. idea. And I mean, it's interesting that I mean, you know, the the cast plywood is the kind of the ground here, yeah. And um, you've spoken in terms of these um, sculptures as you know, the body is landscape, the landscape is body, yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you could speak to that idea, that would be very interesting, I mean, especially in terms of the thistle, which I understand is a sort of invasive species, considered to be an invasive species. Yeah. Um, in much of North America. Yeah. yeah? There are uh, two things. Um, one, um, that collapse of body and landscape in relationship to the title, right? Mm -hmm. um, Odalisque uh, was a, a, a young girl from the Caucasus sold into the Turkish harem as a slave, um, as a sex slave. And thinking about um, the tradition of the reclining nude as presenting you know, largely um, white female bodies as um, um, for consumption. Uh, that there's a that there's something in that what those things express I feel are alt, are also expressive of how we engage with our natural environment, mm -hmm. which is um, could be um, uh, murderous, uh, could be rapacious. Um, there's a violence implied in all of that. The uh, there's one there's a song like uh, a John Prine song that mm -hmm. I feel kind of captures like part of that idea and I always forget words in the middle so you're just gonna have to forgive me because everybody's this is like a stressful situation to be in <laughs> if y'all have ever done this before but um there's Father won't you take me back to Muhlenberg County the side with something where paradise lays. I'm sorry, my son, well, you're too late in asking Mr. Peabody's coal trains come and drug it away. And so the, in West Virginia, instead of bur burrowing into the ground, you mm -hmm. would just uh, scrape the whole top of the mountain off. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, it's like um, pretty, you know, that's, uh, that ties into that sort of um, language of framing these uh, figures and with that title. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then it's, and then the thorns, I mean, the thistles are, you know, when you park in the parking lot in Teton National Park, I'm talking to Mark, Mark's from Jackson, Wyoming, um, that, uh, that those weeds are all around the parking lot. Mm -hmm. as, you, as you go up the trail, there are weeds that lessen the deeper you go. Yeah. And that, they're, that the weeds are almost like viral that just kind of show our... Um, you know, like our nambulation mm. of uh, nature. But at the same time, I kind of like, so all the figures in the room are all sitting up on their own. Like they're not um, leaned up against anything. Mm. And like the playful part is that I like thinking that like maybe they're, um, maybe they're, uh, this is actually great. Maybe they're <laughs> um, doing yoga. <laughs> um, or maybe they're stretching, but this uh -huh. is a great part. Or maybe you all are their um, picnic, picnic banquet. <laughs> like, they're going to roast all of you um, and then have a really nice, lovely picnic. Um, but so I like the idea that, you know, there's always like this, like, Mm -hmm. conversation of the apocalypse, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. Like it's been throughout the work, the burning and the scorching and the so on and so forth. I like that they're like almost at ease at the same time. And then the thistles, which will grow anywhere, are almost an expression that is, you know, human history is like yeah. a tiny little blip in earth history. It's kind of like the same thing as like weather and climate, mm -hmm. you know? But um, I like the thinking that, um, that the weeds will still grow and yeah. You know, the deer will still be. There's a really great poem by Sarah Teasdale, mm -hmm. uh, who was the first, first Nobel laureate from mm -hmm. 1921, um, that wrote a poem just of that. It's called uh, There Will Come Soft Rains. Yeah, yeah. Um, you should all Google it. It's like a 12, 12 line poem. And I mean, I, am I right in thinking that the Scottish thistle, I mean, the name certainly suggests so, mm -hmm. um, came over with white people to um, the United States? You know, I didn't, I, that's not a part of my, like, my interest in them necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Um, but sure. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, there seems to be a lot of kind of business about, I mean, um, with some of the kind of cuts in these sculptures, mm -hmm. you know, they feel very kind of abrupt. I mean, almost like a line that a British colonist would draw between, you know, uh -huh. India and Pakistan, you know, yeah. just before partition. Or, yeah. You know, or in um, North Africa or in the Middle East. Yeah. You know, these sort of. You know, these very kind of abrupt and unhelpful geographies yeah. you know, 
that are created by human beings. Yeah. Yeah? So there seems to be some business about that going on here as well. Yeah. Yeah? Well, I mean, that, that's across the board. I mean, I don't, I don't like the idea of modeling, you know, yeah, yeah. In, in creating an image yeah, so yeah. that the materials that come together, they f they're forced relationships mm -hmm. and that incongruent um, sort of um, idiosyncratic use of materials yeah, yeah. Um, forces meaning. And so, and I also really, I'm, I shamelessly love Brancusi, mm -hmm. and I love how the material, how Brancusi, the material, in relationship to the tool, in relationship to the form, mm -hmm. are, are 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 really along yeah. those boundaries, you know. And so, um, the way that these things are slapped together, I didn't want to fill in the blanks mm -hmm. because that I'm I'm asking you, all, like the viewer, to participate with yeah. me in sort of like thinking about other bodies in relationship to these things. And the more that those lines are less abrupt and more mm -hmm. filled in, then I'm kind of doing that work for you yeah, yeah. or for me too. Um, and so the I think that in relationship to the um, boundaries, it's really clear in all the work mm -hmm. where those lines are really clear. And it, if you look at all, all the work prior to, it's the same. Yeah, yeah. But I like thinking about that. If we're to think about these figures sitting on this um, ground, then the boundary of that ground and how it's defined is like that boundary, mm -hmm. <laughs> is a, which could be um, that there's a river and that makes a boundary, yeah. and that maybe a mountain range makes a boundary. But then that straight line suggests um, like a tremendous, uh, term, horrible event that created that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. it's like, a, I guess, talking about that too. So, I mean, there's clearly the reclining nude um, is a figure that you know reoccurs um, in art history. I mean, we think of kind of you know, Titian and Giorgione using mm -hmm. Sleeping Venus, or yeah. um, you know, Angra's Odalisque, I guess, is yeah. one of the big uh, yeah. works fitting into here. Manet's Olympia, which is kind of slightly more you know, sort of complex in its politics, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, we talked a little bit um, just before this about how many male reclining news we could think of, you know, that are well known from art history. I mean, there's and the <coughs> and the Dying Gaul, mm -hmm. and I guess sort of uh, David's Mara as well. I mean, all of these are kind of, you know, um, injured or dying, or, and in any way kind of, you know, impotent men, yeah. in one way or another, militarily, sexually, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's a kind of interesting thing, I think, in terms of, you know, there is a lot of gender politics, I think, around these works. And yeah. Perhaps you could kind of talk to that. Yeah, I think that there is an, I think that the, um, I think the best thing about at least the election of Donald Trump and the, the sort of rupturing of um, these the sort of ruptures mm -hmm. um, in our moment have uh, given really meaningful context and um, foundation to, I think, aspects that are, things that are happening right now that will, that will create positive change. You know, it's through Me Too or through Black Lives Matter, I think that those things are, have a foothold that, that isn't going to be relegated to, to like a academic discourse, but to real actionable change. Mm -hmm. And I think that like one of the other things that um, is meaningful um, f for me is thinking about how I, how I engage with that change. And so one of them is just the, I think that there's, if, um, this is going to sound really simplistic, but I think that um, if I, if one is white and male, and I can only talk about it really living in the United States, um, that if we're not contemplating how aspects of our masculinity um, reinforce um, ideas that run um, spiritually and philosophically um, against um, um, against my idea of progress, but that how do I embody these things? And so I think that, invalu that um, evaluating aspects of that um, is fundamental to why I'm like making this work now. So um, does that make sense? Yeah. All right. If you have any questions later. Yeah. Um. Oh, but there is another thing, is that the other thing in that is that the, the silence of 
um, that, you know, in terms, especially in terms of the Me Too movement, I think that, that um, silence on behalf of the men in the world um, is simply uh, supporting um, the system that kept that silent um, mm. for um, ever. So, yeah. That's the only thing I was going to say. Okay. Um, I'm really intrigued. This is um, a slight kind of swerve. Yep. Um, reading the press release, um, there's no mention of these rather curious <laughs> objects in the three corners of yeah. the space. Um, was this something that, um, in, during the development of the paintings and the sculptures, you feel um, they called for the introduction of these objects into the exhibition? And perhaps can you talk us through what they are? I mean, they kind of seem to walking stick, divining rod, maybe. Yeah. There are others which are less familiar to me, although they may well be to some other people. This bamboo hole here in the corner. Um, there's. Uh I'm always, so we're sitting in like a pretty traditional art show. There's paintings and then there are these things to bump into while you look at the paintings. Mm -hmm. And then the, you know, and I think that there's um, like for me that I recognize it to, to have this conversation in material and in the image that these things need to be repeated. That's how it's like, you know, it's, um, you know, like we were talking about it, you know, like walking down the street, if I look in a window yeah. and I see um, a, um, a baseball, and then I point at the baseball and I say, blah, 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 and then I'm like, blah, blah, blah. And then we go to the next window, and then we see a baseball again, and I say exactly the same thing, and then I begin to say baseball is no longer baseball, but rather this thing. And so that's what's happening in here. But so there's like an impish, like little elf or something in me that's like constantly needs to problematize <laughs> like to, to problematize uh, the situation but I, it's like I, I recognize um, I was reading something about how um, the water uh, what's the in England the water board they were using dousing rods to um, uh -huh. find Water. I'm totally killing this I right think, now. You're gonna have to Google. Yeah, and so I was just like, whoa. And so in my mind, I just imagine all these guys in blue suits with like a, a stick, uh -huh. you know. And I was like, that's fantastic. But then I was like, oh wait. But see, I would understand that if I somebody saw somebody walking through the woods uh -huh. with like a willow branch yeah, and, yeah. and doing that, that I knew I would know what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. And at the same time, if that willow branch was then placed away from the person using it, I would also recognize its utility, but at the same time in recognizing its utility, I would then see its genesis, mm -hmm. which is a tree, right? Yeah. And so in that moment of recognizing this, this useful object, mm -hmm. I would, that's the only time that I can just see it as a tree. Mm -hmm. Or a, a shillelagh, which is like blackthorn, yeah. or a drinking gourd, yeah, yeah. which is just a gourd dried out, cut off. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a walking stick that maintains a, a lot of its um, original stickiness. But, I mean, you've Not like quite sticky, heavily you know. into the walking stick. Yeah, and your... well, and that's actually you know like kind of like a touchstone for the uh -huh. show that um, it's made of ebony, um, plastic, steel, um, stick. I'm not even sure what kind of tree it comes from. Is stick. anybody that's a great stick? Story, <laughs> it's stick, <laughs> steel, and so I mean that's like but into this thing that's useful, so there, we already have like an understanding of it, but I think that in understanding its utility, we can then see it for what it is. Yeah. Um, and that um, piece of bamboo was uh, given to me from my friend who's on Jackson Hole Ski Patrol, and uh, it's bamboo that they put um, TNT on top of to um, control avalanches. Um, so, you know, we're, you and I are probably the only people, well, maybe if there are skiers in the room, um, yeah, and so it's like I wanted that to be the sort of interplay between t entirely artificial flowers and absolutely um, truthful, like life, ca yeah. life casts of yeah. tree stuff, um, but turned into bronze to let these things be f their natural selves, partially, I guess. Yeah. So I mean, I think is is that is the kind of I mean, how do you feel? Um, the idea and the sculptures of the kind of the life cast works here. I mean, is it sort of index of a kind of truthfulness or, you know? 
Um, yeah. Uh, had always sort of a straight to the pointness. You know? Yeah, I, I'm not, uh, there's no Where's Waldo, you know, it's mm -hmm. like I'm really um, uh, uh, clear. I, I want you to think about bodies and the history of representing mm -hmm. um, bodies in this particular way in relationship to that material. And, um, and you know, it's like things aren't um, uh, anatomically correct, mm -hmm. but correct enough that you really couldn't think that that's a bear mm -hmm. or a fish, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? I mean, I'm always kind of really interested in... <laughs> Maybe if somebody thought it was a fish, that would be amazing. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, the idea that we're very good at recognizing human beings in space because, you know, they're either a friend or a foe. Or, yeah. you know, part of our kind of visual, visual, visio psychological apparatus is about, you know, recognizing people. Yeah. And this idea of anthropomorphism has always been kind of important to your work. Yeah. You know? And I mean, what do you feel you're kind of doing with that idea? You know, what does anthropom and the way people anthropomorphize mean to you? you know, what does that say about us as people? Um, as a species, you know, I think that I can talk about it um, in relationship to climate change. You know, uh -huh. I've been I've been talking about the work for like three days now, yeah. and one of the things that I felt like is pretty is meaningful is that when people see you know wintry snow outside and they're like, oh, you know, it's still winter and it's still snowing, that must mean that climate change isn't real which that is fundamentally an expression of that anthropomorphic mm -hmm. view of nature, right? Because we're expecting our climate to behave like our bodies in the day-to-day yeah. -day and the hour-to-hour, -hour, right? But it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It's two totally different time, time, time yeah. scale. And so, um, you know, I think that um, the, you know, going back to 2006, when we first, mm -hmm. we first met in yeah. Norway, yeah, yeah. which the thing that, glued us together initially was that we both had really weird esoteric knowledge mm. of Wovica, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think we're, we're like in a cafe, I can't remember, but um, I digressed for one moment. Oh, but in 2006, I, I went on this trip, lived in a van for four months. I called it the Bummer Tour, mm -hmm. and I went to historical sites that I felt were like wounds on a hemophiliac that just kept on bleeding and bleeding and bleeding and bleeding, but at the same time started taking photographs of rocks that looked like nature, yeah, looked like people. Yeah, yeah. And I think that I was really struck that um, the way that I arrived to that was that when the, you know, the interstate system opened up and that there were interstates going by these tiny little towns that had never had an economy before, everybody started thinking about what was their special thing. Like, we've got like a giant ball of twine, oh, yeah. or we have the house that is, um, I don't know, na name strange mm -hmm. thing, but at the same time you also had these um, postcards that were, um, you know, like the old man in the mountain, or um, the, the, the there, I became really interested where um, it wasn't just the old man in the mountain, but then it became like Indian head rock, yeah. or even even worse, um, where that it wasn't just like seeing a human, but rather these projections of like um, you know sort of like cultural values, like yeah. racism projected onto a rock. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I found that to be like really um, fascinating. And yeah, I could, I'll, I'll stop there. I, um, I think just to kind of return to the, I'm really interested as well in the sort of, um, the sort of substrate of the sculptures. Yeah. Um, so we have. Oh, underneath. This, underneath. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we have this kind of you know, cast wood and plant mm -hmm. matter, and then something that absolutely feels kind of not of that world. Right? Yeah. Um, well, the, the structure underneath is just gating. Mm -hmm. if, you, if anybody's made a, um, a bronze before, um, you can't just pour into the form. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hot air and uh, overflow needs to be a part of it because the, the casting will be um, imperfect because the metal will cool, cool too fast. Mm -hmm. So um, I've, I really love that. So I'm yeah. suggesting plywood as terra, right? Yeah. And so how does Terra become Terra, right? And it's like we're floating on like a giant ball of magma, right? Mm -hmm. And so thinking about the outermost layer of the Earth's crust, is that molten material like then hardening to a form? And that's mm -hmm. what we're standing on for the most part, right? Yeah. And so I like that there is a part of the process of making this piece of plywood into land, that the process of doing that would be also talking about like mm -hmm. Earth. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and so um, that's, that's why they, they were left there. And it's, um, I mean, they're edited a little bit, like, because they're usually little ringlets, because when they pull it out of the, you know, the pre-casting, it's yeah. fairly light, but after the casting, it's super heavy. But what you're also casting when you make the, the, the thing that you're trying to cast is that you'd also have hooks that you can pull the thing out. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's why. Um, I've got one more question before, and I realize we've been talking for quite a while, so I've got one more question before I'm going to ask and turn it over to these guys. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what projects you're working on next? Oh, so um, I'm doing a performance in Las Vegas um, that is a combination of, <laughs> it's like a Pizza Hut Taco Bell combination <laughs> of, um, <laughs> Who has that? You know, with the combination Pizza Hut and Taco Bell. <laughs> I, I, I like the Pizza that. Hut. <laughs> you like the Taco Bell. I like the combination Pizza Hut and Taco Bell. Um, so, um, the uh, it's basically um, a tour, um, a sort of uh, standing hors d'oeuvres, hors d'oeuvres, um, a cult um, induction, mm -hmm. and then a moment of horror. And then I'm going to take people back to their hotels, and then um, and <laughs> uh, this like in 2016, the drag racing project came to an end, uh -huh. um, and so that's being turned into a sculpture, um, and there are a couple of um, museum shows that are coming up that I'm preparing for. Amazing. But yeah, a lot like the performance. Um, that's next. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Thanks. Does anyone um, here have questions for Matthew? This idea of the stand-in and the replication of, in this case, the, the different e elements that become anthropomorphic. And I wondered if that was something that was going in your mind when you were constructing the move, if that had any sort of connection, or is it just me totally losing the plot? No, um, I think the gen, uh, like what, what struck me, the thing that's like really um, has been a touchstone um, or um, um, an inspiration is there's an um, African-American historian named Nell Irvin Painter that wrote a book called The History of White People. And it's about like the, the construction of this concept of whiteness. And uh, one of the chapters that really uh, stuck with me was um, um, talking about Odalisque and what that um, figure means in terms of gluing Caucasian to white flesh and then simultaneously thinking about um, like beauty in connection with those things and how sort of bankrupt that was in relationship to um, as, an, as an ideology. But um, the thing that really struck me was not just necessarily that, but rather that what did that, art did that, right? So art was a thing that, that persisted these ideas. And so, and that's what forced me to think about, um, think about the sort of like art historical heritage of these forms. Um, does that answer your question? It seems that there wasn't any connection to Archimboldo. For me, mm -hmm. I was thinking there was a very strong European resonance yes. that was making these Abs two yes. really hit off each other in an interesting yeah. way. Um, absolutely, because that's like Western art history in particular, um, absolutely, um, of European heritage, um, making commentary on Europe, not necessarily, but rather using these things. I'm always, I feel like I can't really talk about things that aren't American, because I don't really know what it's like to be somewhere else, you know what I mean? And it's just, it's not because I'm dumb, it's just I'm trying to be as sincere as possible about what I'm talking about. So, um, but it is from, um, it is from other places and other times that do illuminate um, my experience of now and where I'm at. But I still feel like I'm not answering your question. No? Maybe? <laughs> I mean, as I say, the, yeah. to me, yeah. It's a European reference point that yes. seems really pivotal. Yes. But to you, you're saying actually it's not. It has much more of a direct relationship to you as an American. And I'm just interested in that rupture suddenly. Yeah. Um, well, 
the heritage of what I understand to be American does have much of its genesis from Europe. And so thinking about these being particularly um, European art historical conversations, I feel dismembers its potency in our current moment because we don't, like things are becoming more dismembered. There's also a tradition in the United States of still life painting. Absolutely. And there's also a tradition of anthropomorphizing political satire yep. that is not necessarily French. No. Um, so I think, you know, it just happens to be the case yep. that these forms of cultural production have arisen in different places at different times, and one could, as an artist, you know, draw from any variety of sources to yeah. sort of gain insight yeah. or inspiration, if yeah. you want to use that word. And I, but I also think that, like, the, the narrative of um, um, uh, a, female board, a female body portrayed for consumption is really, um, like, a disease that's, like, a... a you know, there's a certain university, you know, there's a certain universality to that that doesn't necessarily have a particular genesis in these things. But the, the Dutch, you know, the paintings in relationship to their moment, to their historical moment is really important in terms of talking about now. And so that at some points it is absolutely important that that's a part of the conversation, but, um, what do they mean here and now? I think it, they begin to sort of float away from that a little bit. Maybe, or maybe I'm just too, too stupid, but anyway. Um, I was just interested when you were using the shotgun, did you do everything, how many, over how many period, like how many days did you do, did you spend shooting? It was a day, it was like uh, four hours. Four hours straight? Yeah, there were 10 of them, because I was trying to, yeah, some turned out better than others. So, and so was it quite painful in the end? You said, yeah. so were you, is that like an ongoing narrative throughout your work that sometimes you have to go endure a bit of pain to get to the, the product well, that you're seeking? I, I mean, I think that I learned the hard way. And, um, but also I, I do think, it's not necessarily about pain necessarily, but rather that I have to be, that where am I in relationship to the thing that I'm being critical of? And if, there, and if I'm not a part of that, then the, what I'm saying is totally meaningless. And so I f believe that the things that I loathe are, are um, things that I embody. Mm -hmm. And I think that in participating in this fairly ugly activity, like I, I had to do it in a day. I couldn't like take a breather and like, <laughs> you know, like stretch it out. I had to keep doing it until it was done. Mm -hmm. um, or else the sort of meditative part or like yeah. that part would be kind of lost or like, um, you know, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Matt, uh, could you also talk about uh, another project you are working at the moment, uh, Black House? What is it about? Um, okay, so before this work, my studio uh, was a house um, that uh, we were gonna try and turn into where my family lived, but we couldn't, it didn't work, we couldn't afford it, and so it was a small place in Brooklyn. And But I realized for the first time that I had um, um, a domestic space mm -hmm. to make an, a show in where um, I did performance and sort of using the different spaces of the house, the living room in relationship to the dining room in relationship to the kitchen or the bathroom, that all of those rooms are different and they mm -hmm. suggest different layers of intimacy in relationship or engagement, you know? Sure. And so um, we took, we painted the, the toilet black, the windows black, the carpeting, everything black. And what I was trying to do is effectively create a um, theater backdrop and so that all of the works that were placed within the house could play the role as, as like, a, like a play. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, um, and so I thought that I was going to have it open for people to come check out. And then I realized that I didn't want to share it with anybody. So we just um, left. <laughs> and now, and now, and now it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, you can't, the only way you can see it is that I'm making a book um, that's like a sort of artist book that um, captures that project. 
it's so the like prototype that's in there. So, yeah. A long yeah. way. I mean, we haven't talked about this, and I'm not sure how many... To be in V, totally fair. That's with Thierry. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And the other thing we see, as we exit through the gift shop yep. here, is um, your diffusion line of jewelry. <laughs> we didn't talk about it. Oh, I'm just such a hack. There's uh, really wonderful no. cabinets. Um, these extraordinary jewelry stands, which um, echo the forms yep. of um, these sculptures. Yeah. My, the very first show that I had, there were two things that you saw when you entered the show. Um, you saw my, a, a video of my mom, um, who's saying a prayer for me, and it's a collaboration that I'm making with my mom. It is absolutely sincere. I saw it as like, you know when you're in the playground as a kid and they're making teams, like, mm -hmm. okay, you're on that team, you're on this team, so on and so forth, and I saw it like that thing that sort of decided, like, if you can't, if you think of this thing as being ironic or that isn't sincere or that you mm -hmm. can't see, like, um, my mom, yeah, yeah. then you're probably not gonna get anything in the show, so you might as well just turn around and leave. <laughs> um, and then the other thing uh, was that I made this uh, sculpture that was called Sculpture from My Left Hand, mm -hmm. and it was using um, the meaning of each of those fingers um, in relationship to how they were adorned. And so you had like, you know, um, civil rights, you had um, like a timelessness, you had, there were like all these narrative mm -hmm. components in the jewelry that like brought, you know, so thinking of like the hand is like a gallery, or the hand is like the house that I just described, that these things all mean different things, you mm -hmm. know, like, yeah, yeah. like married, uh, family, right? So, um, so that I've, I've made them, and also the other thing is that after we shipped everything here, um, I decided it would be fun to think about the studio making jewelry together, mm -hmm. and so, and it was, it was a way to, um, because all the things that we learned about in there at this scale um, is scalable. Mm -hmm. And so learning about how I can take gravel from the parking lot and you know, put it in the wax, mm -hmm. and then the wax goes through the process where there's molten silver around the thing where it doesn't break the rock yeah. apart was like really cool because you could potentially do it at a much larger scale, which mm -hmm. is like, like bronze with stone inclusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's rad. Yeah, yeah. So all the artists in the room like, yeah, let's do this. But, um, and so it was like, it was a way, I mean, for me, the studio is a place that um, we're constantly mm -hmm. doing some pretty radical material yeah, yeah. investigation, but it's also a place to, for fun mm -hmm. and camaraderie. And so that, the, those are like a material um, sort of uh, relic of yeah, yeah. those relationships and of that moment. And so, mm -hmm. It was mostly just to have fun. So they're fun. You can look at them. So it's like, I mean, one of the cases, I mean, some of them are, you know, are very much led by other members of the team, not just you. Oh, yeah, no, for sure. So it's a kind of a you know, beautiful little group show. Yeah. It's a dream. It's great. Yeah, there's a chicken bracelet. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty that good. One, that's, um... And then there's also the most, cr the craziest, um, yeah, just see, there's some really weird stuff. I really like your work, and I always have this connection to Eduardo Paolozzi. Is it just me? I mean, there's something that's actually really exciting that when I have students, you know, when you're young and you decide that you want to be an artist and, and like the ghost of art shows up and is like, ooh, here is everything. <laughs> everything is yours. Do with it as you will. Ooh, and then disappears. And then, but what that suggests is that we have a tremendous amount of responsibility and that in some cases, the things that we make have a heritage to a thing that we actually don't know and oftentimes very super, super intimate relationships with people that are long dead and long gone and people that we'll never ever meet in the flesh. But at this time that it's like sort of like care, it's like a relay race. And so likely, you know, that there are a lot of things alive in here that I didn't intend that have seeped through the other things that I am making reference to that are very much alive and sort of like taken responsibility for from like, I don't know, Bruegel. But I think, um, so yes and no. Does that make sense? It does. It's just, uh, it amazes me that he's not this in, within this pantheon because there was something in this construction that he made of man, but man coming out of a sort of Blake, mm -hmm. pr Promethean yeah. construction mm -hmm. that seems incredibly connected to yeah. your aesthetic.
Well, you have to take in, I mean, the other thing you have to take into consideration too is that like there, I think that growing up in the United States where a lot of my education was likely just a, a void of uh, shit. There are other kids in the room? <laughs> a void of shit. You know, it's, it, that it, I think that there are a lot of things that as I happen upon them, like one of the best things about that is that, I, that the, the plurality of how I do address things, um, um, like I'm not a historian. I'm not an art historian. I'm not a scientist. I'm just an artist. And so the, the sort of space that that allows me to bump into stuff, and it's actually the reason why the walking stick is here is that I like fundamentally believe that like I'm just wa like wandering through mm -hmm. the world and that these things are a way in which I can like capture some of that experience and talk talk about it um, but yeah sorry but you know what probably now yeah all the work after this after I talk to um, <laughs> the guy sitting to the right of me at Hauser and Worth and to you know yeah but, yeah I mean I, th I mean I can absolutely see where that comes from I think it's partly you know, there's a sort of shared interest in space mm -hmm. at the very start. You know, the human figure is absolutely central to it. I mean, there's a pop sensibility. I mean, like, you know, first wave pop, we a lot of see, and mm -hmm. then, you know, a kind of whatever wave we are at now with you. you know? yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it absolutely makes sense, I think. That's why it's really good to have really smart friends. <laughs> <laughs> so. Hi, uh, I just want to ask a very basic question. Um, I'm really fascinated by the paintings. Okay. Have you had a plan what you're going to do before you started in painting? Um, because like you, the, the flower is surrounded by the silver and the wood underneath. Do you plan it before or you, afterwards you just uh, build it underneath or something? Um, they're, I mean, because in or the way that they're made, um, the way that the formica is assembled, that there's you know, a lot of uh, time like working up to it. So there's a tremendous amount of planning. Um, in terms of the backgrounds, though, that um, after we've m assembled all the Formica pieces, um, they're screen printed, and then they're just kind of raw. They don't have a background at that point because uh, you wouldn't be able to screen print with the background it's raised. Um, so there is something. Um, Excuse me. Yeah. Did you say the painting is screen, pla screen print? What do you say? Uh, screen printed, yeah, really? it's screen printed, yeah. Oh. So, well, I mean, no, it's there's formica, and then over the top of the the thing that's creating the color is a material, right? Which is countertop material, and then over the top of that is um, a screen print. That's what the image on top comes from, yeah. And then the backgrounds um, are sometimes um, known from the very beginning, um, but sometimes they're made up in the end. And in the case of the lead works. Um, those were, I guess, the most um, gestural and unplanned. Is that? I found them really interesting. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Did you use the word we a lot? Do you make these yourself? Or? Uh, they're the, um, I, ha I have uh, four people in the studio um, that work on a multitude of things. Um, so the... It is, it's about, well, yeah, we all touch it at some point, and I'm the one that comes along and makes the backgrounds to, and does the casting and the screen printing. Um, but so in terms of a workshop, um, I come from a printmaking background, and so etching and lithography. So working in that environment and recognizing that there are things that I'm like not as good at but it's not the work's fault that I should be doing it necessarily. Like in the case of the bronze works, like I, like to make a bronze casting of that is like to a level of um, ability that's way beyond my ability. And just in terms of facility, like I can't cast the bronze. Mm -hmm. So um, in some cases with the drawings that um, sometimes it's all me and then sometimes it's mostly me and then in sometimes it's all me at the beginning, but at the end it's like really the foundry that like makes the thing. So um, does that answer your question? Okay. But actually, but going back to the studio, it's like the, that environment when I was a printmaker and 
you know, I worked with a lot of really well-known artists. When they would come in, they were like, I want to make this big thing, but it's black and it's like this. And they had no idea how to do it. And so it was entirely in my hands to make that thing. And, but while making that thing, I wasn't making what I, my thing. I was making their thing. And so um, I really liked that exchange. Yeah. Um, so earlier today, my friend and I were talking about how um, contemporary art uh, is about making that meta conversation about various points in art history. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had any um, references that I may have missed that you kind of draw on um, that you'd probably like to talk about. Early on, like my initial interest in the reclining figure um, went back to a photograph um, of this. There's a photograph of um, just before the Wounded Knee Massacre that there's a man um, named Spotted Elk. And if you look at the photograph of him, he's, he's dead and he's frozen in the ground where it looks like he's like sitting up, but it looked, he, he's like dead, but it looks like he's coming alive. It looks like he's um, really, his body position is um, really strange. Mm -hmm. And I've always been really fascinated with that, how, like how to capture this idea of um, defiant and defeated, living and dead, lying down and struggling to get up all at the same time in this fixed and frozen position. Um, and so there's like a part of that interest in these things. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that there's, um, that's what, maybe that, that's one thing that I think about. But. Um, this is probably more of a random comment than a question. And firstly, I just want to say the show's amazing. Thank you. Um, I was really struck when you started off talking about Trump. Yeah. And obviously we have our problems here yeah. right now. And I guess, I don't know if this is wishful thinking or not, but do you think if you make work like this, on, that's quite nuanced and it's got a lot in it and it takes the tone of the conversation somewhere else yeah. and it's got layers to it, do you think that in itself is... Um, a very valuable riposte to this kind of rhetoric that we're all exposed to at the moment that's very depressing. Yeah. Well, um, you know, we're artists, right? And I think that the things that we make, do, we're, I'm, I am super lucky that I get to share these things with other people. Um, and in those moments of sharing these conversations that offer an opportunity to maybe think about something differently, that there, there is an accumulation. It is like snow, that these things do accumulate. And it's like one of the things that we're, we've experienced in both here with Brexit and in the United States with the election of Donald Trump is um, this idea of privilege, right? It's like felt like it was for, for time indeterminate that... Uh, this privilege was going to constantly provide, you know, uh, the like white <laughs> patriarchy with like three percent a year of progress, but at the same time not recognizing that there's progress, right? And that disengagement with progress, which recognize, which forced them to recognize that, that that they're dying, and that there's that they're that this privilege has seen its end, hopefully. And that progress is, continues, and so I think that as artists, it, we are like in like tiny, maybe immeasurable, pathetic little ways that we do are adding to that snowfall of progress. And so, in that regard, yes, but also at this time too, you know that these events happen. Um, that that conversation, maybe there'll be people that don't agree with what I'm saying today, or maybe there'll be people that do agree with what I'm saying, or maybe they're just like, maybe this is like a time to zone out and think about something else entirely, but built upon like what we're experiencing now, that there is, that, that is, that's how the progress, that's how progress has happened, that's how progress is unstoppable, that's, you know, so does that answer your question? No. Is that it? I think so, great. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thanks.